Our next speaker it comes to us from the Oxford in Internet Institute. She is a postdoc research fellow there. She was with us last year, I think, as well. So give a warm round of applause to Dr. Sandra Wachter. Hi. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, yes, my name is Sandra Wachter. I'm actually now a research fellow, assistant professor at the University of Oxford. I've been promoted. Um, I work at the Internet Institute, and I also work at the Alan Turing Institute in London, which is the National Data Science Center for AI. Um, and I want to talk about um, accountable and explainable AI. So as I said, I'm a lawyer. That means I'm usually the party pooper, because I have to tell people what they can and cannot do. And this talk will be exactly that, because we are talking about all the advantages of AI, but we have to keep in mind that there are risks associated with it. A couple of them were already mentioned. Inscrutability, complex systems that can't be explained, but make very important decisions about us. And to show that this is not just an academic problem, I just brought a couple of examples that have recently happened in the past that show that we have to do something about it. I think that is one of the most famous examples that came up um, in the last two years or so. Um, the, a famous report of ProPublica that was assessing a risk score algorithm that determined whether somebody should be granted parole or not. And it was found that the algorithm was racially biased and assigned a higher risk to black people than to white people. So this is obviously an algorithmic problem. Um, another interesting thing that happened was that it was found that Google shows ads to women with lower wages than it shows to men. So this is interesting, especially um, uh, considering the, the, the gender pay gap that still exists. So there's an algorithmic bias problem here. Another example that's actually quite old, just to show that this is not something that just emerged, there was a study in the mid-80s um, that has found that applications from students to medical school were racially and sexually biased. So this is not a new problem, we just haven't fixed it yet. Um, and the last, um, the, and another example I want to give is, and um, that has to do with credit scores, um, that found that credit scoring applications are racially biased as well. So that was an example where credit scores were determined by looking at your social network on Facebook and determine whether or not you're going to be likely to fold on a loan. And it was found that this was disadvantaged in certain minorities in our society. But this is not the only thing. It's also embedded um, algorithm that make problems, as we just recently saw with the Uber crash. Right? This is also an automated decision, an algorithm that decides whether to brake, accelerate, and something failed and somebody had to die. So what those examples have in common is that you either had to go to prison, you didn't get the loan, you didn't get in university, and you feel like that this, this, this decision wasn't right. So the initial urge that you have is to say, why? I want an explanation. I want to know why this decision was made in a certain way. And this is a topic I've been working on for quite some time now, to figuring out how we can offer individuals meaningful explanations. I started thinking about this problem from a legal perspective. And um, last year, I wrote a paper from a legal perspective assessing our new data protection framework, the Data Protection Directive, which has come which just came into force to assess whether or not we're going to have a right to explanation. And that was something that was hoped for, but we wrote a very long paper saying that there are actually so many loopholes and you probably don't have a legally mandated right to get an explanation if an algorithm is making a decision about you. I found this result actually unsatisfying, and I decided not to take no for an answer. Just because it's not legally mandated doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing it. It would be the ethical thing to do, to give you an explanation if important decisions are being made about you. So I started to think about where is there so much resistance of offering explanations for algorithm decisions. And those are the four evergreens that always come up if I urge somebody to explain themselves when it comes to algorithms. The first is, well, if I give too much transparency, this could infringe, infringe trade secrets, intellectual property rights, or the privacy of other people, because I could reverse engineer the algorithm and figure out who was in the training data set. 
other people say, well, it's technically unfeasible because you know it's too complicated. You cannot explain what's going on in the neural nets. Not even the coders know what's going on. It's impossible. Others say, well, there are methods to explain parts of it, but if I explain it to a lay audience, it might not be very meaningful. You would have an expert to explain it to you, and that might be very challenging. And the last example is too much transparency can allow people to manipulate a game system. And all of these answers are reasonable, and they're right. But again, I don't think it's good enough to say, let's stop trying to make systems more explainable. Again, I don't want to take no as an answer for that, which is why we published another paper um, a couple of months back where we tried to take those considerations into account. A paper is called um, Counterfactual Explanations Without Opening the Black Box, Automated Decisions in a GDPR. Um, it's a very long paper. It's publicly available as any, if anybody is interested. In that, and here we try to do something different, because we, tr we, we actually figured that this is an interdisciplinary problem. This is not just a technical problem. It goes much broader. So I was a lawyer on that paper. Brent Middlestead, who was an ethicist, worked on this. And Chris Russell is a machine learning expert. So we had three different disciplines working on a project together to figure out how we can offer meaningful explanations. And the first thing that we thought about is, what does make an explanation a good explanation? What is it that you actually want to know when you ask for an explanation? So the first thing that we did is we looked at philosophy and cognitive science. And it was found there that some kind of contrastive explanation, counterfactual explanation, is the most useful and is one of the examples that we use in our daily lives. You usually have a certain expectation that something should happen, but it didn't happen. So you want to know why, why that one thing happened instead of the other. So that means that is the core of why you want to have an explanation, a counterfactual one. And it's the, the start of a dialogue, basically, because you're interrogating, you're engaging in a dialogue because you want to know what's happening there. So keeping that in mind, um, contrastive explanation, counterfactual explanations have very close ties to established scientists that think that those are the best kinds of explanations. You can have, want to have explanations for various reasons, and we figured what would be the most useful goal for an explanation, looking at the end user, looking at the person who applied for a loan that had to go to prison, uh, was not admitted to university. So we came up with three reasons why those people might want to have an explanation. First, you might just want to understand why you didn't get the loan, right? You might also be tempted to challenge the decision if you feel like that's unjust, unfair, and want to have a better um, decision instead. Or you want to ha have an interest of alter future decisions. It might just be that the decision was fair and unbiased, but you know your reference set is very good enough, your grades very good enough, but you know how to improve yourself in order to get the job in the future, for example. So we figured using those goals for explanation could be solved with counterfactual explanations, actually. So here's a bit of the, the formula that we used in, in, the, um, in the paper to describe how those counterfactuals can be computed automatically. Um, so that's the math. And this can be translated in a very understandable way for the end user, which would be something like that, giving a loan example. That means you were denied a loan um, because the income was 30,000 pounds. If it had been 45,000 pounds, we would have offered you the loan, right? The same can be said, for example, um, for any kind of decision. Um, it could be your grades, it could be your income, it could even be your race. So you could also say, yeah, we would have offered you a loan if you had been white. So this is an interesting term, um, something to keep in mind in terms of fairness. So to put this in context with a bit of math here, so what we do actually is, so this is the equation, the neural net, and you are here uh, where the x says zero. You didn't get the loan, you were denied parole, and I'm telling you how to get from zero to two. This is what I'm telling you. What I'm not trying to do is explain the why, the blue line, right? So you don't need to know everything about the algorithm in order to figure out why something happened in your particular case. Um, to look this a bit more in, in context here, you can see the blue line is the decision boundary. Once you touch that, you get the loan, right? You get into um, university. But you have been outside 
the decision boundary. So what we do is expand this slowly and see what are the minimal changes under the current decision system that need to be different from get you from where you are to where you want to be. So once you touch that, I can give you the information what in your particular case made the outcome as it is. And you could have multiple counterfactuals as well, which could be, for example, um, here. So I could give you multiple explanations, offer them to individuals, and let them choose what's the most easiest way for them to change it. For others, it might be that they have savings somewhere. Others might be able, able to change their jobs, something like that. So it, it's more agile in that thing. Um, counterfactual explanations have many, many advantages. Because I'm not giving you a whole picture of how the algorithm works. I'm just telling you the minimal changes that you need to do to get from where you are to where you want to be. One of the things that I mentioned before was so much resistance comes from the idea that we cannot explain the internal logic of the algorithm. Using counterfactuals, you don't need to do that. You don't need to explain the logic of the algorithm in order to give a counterfactual explanation. And counterfactuals can be generated in super complex systems like neural nets. So that's another, another argument that is out the window. And the last one that's also very important is counterfactual explanations are less likely to infringe on rights or freedoms of others. So intellectual property rights, trade secrets, privacy. Because I'm not giving you the whole source code. I'm just giving you the most important features that need to change. And this is also preventive for gaming or manipulating the system. So it's trying to find a very good middle ground between all the competing interests that are currently at stake. And if you look at the example that I gave um, at the beginning, um, all the goals that I mentioned, understanding, challenging, altering decisions, is something that could be done with counterfactual explanations. I do understand that income was important in making the decision. If I actually make more and I actually make 45,000 pounds, I can come back and challenge the loan decision and say, hey, could you please consider that again? It could also tell you, um, and if I actually make just 30,000 pounds, I know what to do in order to improve myself to get the loan in the end. And from the fairness perspective, it could also be interesting because if it tells you that your gender or your race was an attribute, you could actually kick up a stone and say, actually, I don't think it's accurate that you're using those attributes in making those decisions. So it's a very good step forward in terms of, um, in terms of making explainable AI more, to, uh, making AI more explainable and transparent. So even though I, I started off with giving all the horrible examples that we saw in the past, I want to close with something that is positive and say, Keep calm and don't take no for an answer. Are we there yet? Can we fully explain how an algorithm works? No. Are there problems with discrimination? Yes, there are. But people are doing work and making their best to improve those things. And I think it's very important to keep in mind that a lot of those problems are not just technical problems. You actually need other disciplines to work together to come up with um, sensible solutions that are feasible and actually deliver the promise so we can fully harness the potential of AI. Thank you.